Pass. Hi, everyone. So we're going to keep this one a little bit more casual. Um, as a youth panel, we do like to be a bit youthful. Um, so we're all going to be sitting here, and it's going to be a conversation. And we'd like to invite everyone to join us in this conversation. So at the end of our moderated panel, there will be time for questions, and we'd love to hear from you guys. Um, but as Tipora already mentioned, I am part of Youth Advocates for Climate Action Philippines, which is a really long name, and I am part of the steering committee of the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty, which is, I think, even a longer name. Um, but maybe that means that we're, you know, shorter steps towards climate justice if you have long names. But <laughs> to introduce my co-panelists, I'm so, so honored and privileged to be alongside such amazing people from across the globe. So first we have Shie Bastida, is a climate justice activist and co-founder of ReEarth Initiative with an Otomi Toltec background who advocates for centering of frontline communities in climate policy. And then next to her we have Zuhair Ahmed Kaushik from Stockholm 50 Youth Task Force and EarthDay.org. So he co-founded the Youth Environment and Social Development Society in 2015, which is a youth-led nonprofit organization to empower young leaders to play critical and competitive roles in sustainable development through climate actions. Then we have beside him Farzana Farouk Jumu from Fridays for Future Bangladesh. She's a climate justice activist based in Dhaka, Bangladesh, and has been working with Fridays for Future Bangladesh and international and promoting the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty in a lot of her work. And next, last but not least, we have Kalo Afiaki, who is a Tongan, Maori, and Palangi descent and is the coordinator of the Pacific Climate Warriors. So at this transition, um, at this pre-summit for a global just transition, I'd like to assume that everyone in the room understands just how bad fossil fuels are. If we have anyone from the fossil fuel industry here, I'd like to maybe, because the summit next door is the Asian Development Bank, which is actually funding a lot of fossil fuels. So maybe if they can hear us, maybe they'll learn a thing or two about what actual development looks like. But um, I wanted to start the session with a question to Shihei about the fossil fuel extraction, how it's harmful to people's daily lives. I feel like so often we see and understand and talk about the macro level, the impacts of fossil fuel industries on climate impacts, the destruction that's happening in our countries, in our communities. But what does it look like on the individual scale? Um, hello. Hi, everyone. Um, it's so nice to be here. Thank you, Mitzi, for the wonderful introduction and for keeping it light with humor. That's also very needed. Um, I'm so honored uh, to share this space with my wonderful co-panelists and to see so many youth um, in, in the audience as well. Uh, like Mitzi said, I'm part of the Otomi Toltec Indigenous Community, which is an indigenous group in the highlands of central Mexico, which means that I was raised with a kind of worldview that is different from most of my friends and most of the people that are in, in my life in, in the U.S. That's where I go to school. Um, that worldview is one of reciprocity. If we take, we must give back. It's a worldview of intergenerational cooperation, a worldview where we practice a seven generation principle. Every decision that we make has to be done with the past seven generations wisdom to ensure the stability of the future seven generations. And it's really a shame that we have not been looking at the world in this way. Even with the 50 years of Stockholm, that's still just one or two generations there. We are not counting the wisdom and everything that the future has to offer for our children. And so with this worldview, I know that we don't only need system change, but we need a change in spirituality, in our connection to Mother Earth. And I think that spaces like this can bring in that indigenous worldview and bridge it with Western legal systems to ultimately protect Mother Earth because that is what we are really missing. The essence, the emotions, the stories. And only with that can you move people, only with that can we make an impact. But that is not enough to legally protect everything that we hold dear. That is why a treaty is important. That's why we need people to come together from all over the world and if you haven't, put your name on the treaty. Um, and like Mitz said, I am going to talk about the impacts of the fossil fuel industry and really 
most extractive industries because it's not only the fossil fuel industry that we have to shift away from. It's the extractivist uh, system that we have fallen into that includes the mining uh, that's happening in a lot of communities. That includes, you know, the, our extraction of, of resources from soil, um, of the, the health of soil. But on the fossil fuel um, lane, we are hearing a lot about the shift away from coal, but we haven't heard a lot about the shift away from natural gas. And even the name is greenwashing itself. Uh, I actually did a paper on the physical and psychological effects of fracking. And I love when people say, youth activists have to go to school, and we are, and we are researching, and we are reading. And what my research found is that not only does fracking have negative effects on um, endocrine problems, smell and hearing distortions, immunological deficiency, increasing cancer rates, skeletal pain, and many, many others, and these things are very medical terms, but it shows you that communities that are targeted by the fossil fuel industry are actually having worse health um, effects that we know this, but I love that there's research to back that up. Uh, in the psychological part, there's negative effects on mood, behavior, performance in school, distortion of perception, dis distorts the perception of social norms, and disturbs one's general sense of well-being. And this makes sense because if a, commu if a fracking company comes in and destroys and pollutes your community, it is going to tear what you see as well-being, what you feel is right around you. And I, will, I would really like that we take that narrative with us, the stories that come from the communities that have been affected. Um, just to close before I talked for too long, I'm so sorry. Um, in the United States, there is a report that actually measures the demographics of a community to see how susceptible it is to stand up politically. It measures so the community's percentage of immigration. It measures the community's race. It measures the community's education level. The lower the education level, the higher the immigration population is, meaning undocumented communities, and the higher the diversity of the community, the more likely it is that a fossil fuel company will go in there because they see that community as having less political power. That is why everyone in the global north has to advocate for those communities in the global south that are being intentionally targeted to be the sites of fossil fuel extraction. And that is where the justice comes in, where the equitable transition comes in, and is really, you know, giving us the opportunity to go into this new era with a different type of thinking that is just not only for our planet, but for its, her people. Thank you. Thank you, Sheev. Do any of you want to add anything to that before we go to the next question? Kala, I was thinking that you might have something to add, or would you like to wait until later? <laughs> so um, the next question is, since we did just talk about the impacts of fossil fuels on young people and individuals and communities, so on the policy level, since um, she also mentioned it, Zuhair, what do the youth want to see in terms of policies? You've been working on the youth with the Youth Task Force with the Stockholm 50 conference. Um, what does the youth want in terms of policies? Thank you. Uh, is it working? Okay. So we know that youth are activists, advocates, early career scientists. They are educators. They are everywhere, and they are taking action to uh, phase out fossil fuel. And we have bring together. Uh, we have brought together around 50 young people from all around the world in this task force who are not just activists, they belong to different uh, communities, they have di diverse backgrounds, they have come together, they have formed this uh, task force, they are from different uh, constituencies, they are from different organizations, and all these people, they have worked their heart out for the last two years to make this policy paper. And we are here now with the policy paper uh, to present to our policymakers and member states the, that what 
to show what our expectations are and what they should, uh, uh, they should reflect on their policies and negotiations. So I would like to take the honor to uh, read out some of the recommendations and expectations from the policy paper. And uh, later, I'll be adding my narratives on it. So from the policy paper, to achieve a sustainable and inclusive recovery from COVID-19 pandemic, we urge governments to align all recovery spending into low carbon investments, green jobs, and future-proof sectors to avoid carbon lock-in of fossil fuels and standard assets impeding sustainable development. In accelerating the implementation of environmental dimension of sustainable development goals, in the context of decade of action, we urge member states to commit to expanding formal and non-formal education regarding the causes, effects, and solutions of the climate crisis, biodiversity loss, and environmental degradation to enhance capacity among youth and children and prepare them for green jobs and build a sustainable future. Immediately establish a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty to phase out fossil fuels and scale up 100% safe, clean, and sustainable energy for all in order to reach net negative emissions by 2050. Strengthen the environmental rule of law and ensure that the polluter pays principle is applied by integrating all environmental, social welfare, and health costs to harmful activities. Now I want to add my narratives. So uh, she has talked about oil, coal, and gas. Now I want to uh, 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 talk about another criminal, another fossil fuel criminal in this case, and that's plastic. I have seen a lot of reports. They are actually comparing plus global plastic treaty, uh, saying that it's actually diverting our attention from uh, this fossil fuel treaty. It's not like that. You know that this uh, plastic industry, they will end up using 20% of total consumed of total oil by 2050. So that means it's going to uh, emit a lot of carbon in the environment. And also, this sector, um, plastic is not just plastic. It's oil, gas, and chemicals. So it's even more harmful. So we need a treaty which actually address the entire life cycle of plastic. And I believe that this plus, uh, fossil fuel treaty and global plastic treaty, if we can, you know, uh, uh, build a synergy among these two, it will create a lot of change. Otherwise, if we like work separately and, uh, uh, you know, there is no cooperation between these two, then what will happen, you know, at the end of the, uh, of this agreements and treaty, we'll end up organizing annual picnic and exhibition in the name of COPS every single year, where the global leaders will come and lecture us what our common responsibilities are and what we should do. They will not talk about what their responsibilities are. Okay, I think that fits in the time. Thank you. Thank you, Zuer. I think it's so Im interesting to note that what you said on plastics and fossil fuels, so often we're almost pit put against each other, saying that, oh, um, the plastic cr waste crisis is different from the activists of the climate justice movement, but really it's the same thing. It's still the fossil fuel industries that's behind both of them, and that separation, I don't know if you were here in the panel before this, but Ina was talking about divide and conquer, and that's the same thing. It's a system dividing these issues as if they're not connected, dividing these crises as if they're not stemming from the same thing. And that is the thing that she was talking about earlier, the way that we use energies, the way that we use, that we produce. It's not just about the renewable and the fossil fuel industry and the energy systems. It's about all of this, how our economy is based on that over exploitation of the global south to profit for the global north, right? Um, and next, we've been talking about how, you know, all these bad things and all these things that are happening, but my personal favorite uh, to hear about are the stories of resistance. And we have Kahlo here from the Pacific Climate Warriors, and I absolutely love their slogan. I will let her be the one to say it because it's beautiful. Um, and I want to hear about how the youth in your areas, in the most affected areas in the Pacific Islands, how are they fighting back? Hello. Okay. 
Malo e tau mau, ko kui ngoa ko kalo a fiaki ko loe mai miha to uha pa e to fo to nga tapu nga ti ka ngunu ki te wai roa ai lani mo piritania. Can we please take a moment in this busy, busy day and I ask that you repeat after me and I'll say it slowly. Malo e lele. Malo e lele. We'll say that with a little bit more energy. I know it's the afternoon, but come on. We have a saying from my country, mate ma atonga. Just we'll do it, right? So malo e lele. Malo e lele. Yes. You have now greeted everyone in the language of my home, the Kingdom of Tonga. I am here today on behalf of the Pacific Climate Warriors, which is a network of young people across the Pacific region with teams in the US, Australia, and Aotearoa, New Zealand, where I've traveled from. We are fighting against climate change, and it is tiring, but we will keep at it, because if not us, then who? Young Pacific people, have been fighting against climate change in four our islands for decades. I'm excited to be in the home of Greta Thunberg, but before her was Brianna Fruin, who has been fighting for climate justice since she was 11 years old. She is now 24. More than a decade of her life has been spent fighting for our islands, and I'd like to a round of applause for Bibi right now, please. In 2019, the Pacific Climate Warriors, alongside School Strike for Climate, led, led 40,000 people along Lampton Key, which is in Te Whanganuiatara in Wellington. We marched onto the steps of Parliament that day. Across Aotearoa, New Zealand, over 100,000 people marched, most of them young people. I vividly recall on the steps of parliament, a Toke Lawin preschool being there. They were a part of the strike. And for those of you who don't know what a preschool is, it's a kindergarten. Um, I'm mindful that we use a perhaps different terms. And I can really recall that. And I think about the sacrifices our young people have to make. This morning, Zapora mentioned that it would be great if youth could be youth. I agree. It would be great if our young people could be young people. Because in this crisis, even our babies, literally preschoolers, are having to join this fight. That is not fair. And so when we think about a just transition, when we think about our fair share, I want you to think of the children who are taking up this task uh, created by a generation that was before us. We know the science around the climate crisis. We know that fossil fuels are driving this, and that has been touched upon by my beautiful panelists today. And we know that the fossil fuels are being burnt at the detriment of the global south, at the detriment of Pacific nations, at the detriment of my home of Tonga. We know the devastating impacts of the climate crisis, but this does a disservice to our Pacific nations, to our people on the front line who are continuing to fight for our survival. I think of the climate crisis and I see resilience. When Cyclone Kita, a Category 4 cyclone, hit my home island of Tonga, 80% of our population was impacted, over 4,000 homes. And I want to put that in perspective, we have 100,000 people, 80,000 were impacted. And yet, when I think of the devastation that that cyclone wreaked, I think about the strength it also built because our communities came together, people sheltered those who lost homes, our global diaspora sent financial support, and that came from across the world. And so when I think about the climate crisis, I think about the power of collective resilience, because we look out for each other, because we have to. But there is a cost to this crisis. My family are on the front line of climate change. Their livelihoods are severely impacted by this crisis. Our export business depends on agriculture. Productions, for example, from coconuts. And this industry is being impacted by climate change. And that is because of extreme droughts, cyclones, and salinized soil. When Cyclone Gita hit, coconuts were devastated and they couldn't even grow. For a lot of you, when I speak of the Pacific, probably the image that comes to mind are sandy beaches, coconut leaves swaying in the wind, and holiday destinations. Can you imagine then an island without coconuts? Because that was Donga after 2018. Regardless of this, my family have paid pay forward. They reached out to the outer islands, they diversified, they looked at other ways to create supply, and they are staying alive, but barely. 
When I think of resilience, I think of the resilience of my father, Bosi Mafiaki, my brother, Gimi Afiaki, who continue to lawe lava from Tonga or strive forward regardless of the challenges that they face. They are the faces that I see when I think of resilience, but there are many faces of resilience. They are here today. They are here in this room. The Pacific continues to lead globally as a moral voice on climate action and leadership. And so if you need inspiration, look to the Pacific, because we have the answers for you if you're still looking for them. I really hope you're not. I really hope you have the answers that you need. I hope that I do not have to be at this conference in the next 50 years, because that means we're not listening to indigenous communities. It means that we are going to be repeating ourselves. And honestly, I think when I'm 70, I'm going to be less kinder <laughs> when I'm sending this message. <laughs> I hope that young people, I hope that us, I consider myself young still, I hope that we don't have to be here, and I hope that we can enjoy being young, being free, being wild, because right now, we're not. <laughs> we're here at a conference when we could actually just be partying and living our lives. I really hope that we will do what we can today, and I'm really looking forward to the discussions that are to come, and I hope that we take action, because if we don't, we're going to lose islands like Donga, and to be honest, we're going to lose people then like me, and I don't want that. Yeah. I think we can all agree that we would hate to lose people like Carla, such a vibrant energy. Um, and it's interesting to note what you said about that community resilience, because in the Philippines, it's been weaponized against the people, where the governments are like, oh, you're so resilient, claps for you, and then doesn't do anything. Right? So there, where is the structural resilience, the government accountability, and it's been used against that? Um, so when we're talking about the fights for climate justice, it's getting more and more complicated, I would say, because now even governments are sometimes saying climate justice or climate action are like, oh, we're climate leaders, we're great. And I'm like, sure. Um, so now we're at this point in time where we have to narrow down our messaging and make things clearer and make things more intersectional or anti-imperialist or anti-colonialist or whatever it is, the term that's, been used, that's being used now, it's all the same thing, really. Um, so for Zana, this is something that you talk about a lot. What do you think our fight for climate justice must look like, especially in the youth movement? Well, okay. So, um, first of all, after Kalo, I, I feel like everything I will say <laughs> will like sound, um, I don't know. She was so awesome, but <laughs> I know. <laughs> yes, uh, so, but I know that justice is something we don't want to talk about because after all uh, after all this we are still sitting here with a lot of lights and i'm shining but currently there is a flood in my country there was 50 degrees celsius in my country with the worst uh, heat wave and after that we are so ready for that flood which will come after the heat wave so this is not fair first of all this is not fair that i'm here and talking about climate change because this is not something i should do as a color side already but this is also not fair that the person who know for years that how to uh, fight against climate change uh, who have the ideas of resilience are not uh, heard so we need to make sure that uh, we can talk more about local led adaptation because the solution is already here the solution is already here when the people are oppressed they were oppressed by the system for years and yet they can actually fight back more than any of us so First of all, the climate justice should look like a person who is currently fighting in any of our country and who knows how to uh, fight back and okay, their face should be what climate justice looks like. And also, 
it is a global problem but uh, as Missy already said we actually divide with every problem but uh, the problem is also connected if I'm talking about feminism the uh, the female in my country have to take pregnancy pill so that they don't uh, need to, uh, they don't get their periods because in salty water they have no way to like uh, when they are in period they can't like use that water and that's why they need to take pregnancy pills so this is a feminist issue and if we are not talking about those uh, affected by climate we are not talking about feminism if I am talking, uh, okay, I, uh, I don't want to talk about indigenous people. Uh, this is because already we have like awesome panelists and we can also hear a lot from them as well. So, but they are also connected. And when we talk about their land, when we see that their land has been taken, it's also connected to climate change. And, uh, then when we are actually asking for treaties i shouldn't just say that is this uh, treaty will ask for a transition which is just yes and that's why actually i'm here supporting this treaty because the third pillar is just transition why we need just transition because the people in my country who uh, are in a land farming they can't lose their land and if I actually ask my government that why don't you uh, shift to renewables they will say that we don't have land but if we are like pushing them too much they will take this land from those farmers and use it for renewables and we don't need that transition where people from our I mean, uh, front line actually need to lose their lands we need a system where actually they can have their lands and yet uh, it's just for everyone and uh, so and also like missy also mentioned we don't say how uh, this money from fossil fuel is actually affecting us we are saying that this is and this is our way to uh, like make everyone have their money and only the few people have and thanks to capitalism uh, they are making everyone like uh, you have to work more for fight uh, for yourself and this is you who are making this all things going bad you didn't turn off the light that's why we are actually dying so this is how actually um, the capitalism and greenwashing is working when they are always saying that it's you who made the mistake and uh, so you need to suffer this is what uh, you have like every every decision have a consequence and it was your decision to not turn off the light so why why are you even complaining and as a youth, we actually listen to a lot that why you are even complaining. We just wanted to give you a better life, but I don't think so. It's better life when my people have to like die and I have to see and uh, like in a shiny room, I have to tell some people that yes, people in my country is dying. It's also uh, because of the media. I also talk about a lot that how media is like, uh, saying a narrative which is if flood in Germany is happening then oh my god climate change is here we need to do a lot of thing and at the same day there was flood in Bangladesh and nobody talked about it nobody ever said that the person who is in Bangladesh how their crops is uh, how is their crop and uh, is they have food and we were like okay now we need climate uh, action against climate change the climate change is not white so the action shouldn't be white the action should be colorful like a spectrum and this is actually what climate justice looks like thank you for Zana just on that thing about turning off lights um, I get that all the time. Um, 
in the Philippines, the let the earth breathe, like that hashtag trended because of the scientist protest of scientist rebellion, I think last April, where they glued themselves to Chase Bank. And everyone was like, oh, the climate crisis is here. We have to delete our emails because of the carbon footprint that it costs. And I'm like, delete emails? That's the, that's the solution that you're thinking of? That's the climate justice world? I wish it was that easy. I'll delete all my emails. I'll never look at another email. Like, I'll go <laughs> offline if that's how you solve the climate crisis. So, and I think so often we're always like, we need system change. We need to change what's happening. But people think that the solutions are these things, turning off lights, deleting emails, planting trees, which are great, but not enough. So my next question is, I think we're at this point where we actually need to show people, tell people, what is this better world that we're building? We have to create in that mind's eye that, to have that radical imagination of thinking of a system outside of this one that we're in now. And it's so difficult because imagine, I'm sure there's like a, like a psychological or like, like a, there's a Plato's cave or something, some theory where it's like, you see nothing else. You don't know anything else aside from what we're seeing now. But there are communities that know. There are communities that know what to do. And that's what Farzana and she, that's what everyone has been saying in this panel. So my question now is, what are we fighting for? What is that climate justice world? What does it look like to you? What are the alternatives? To me, it's a world where I can party. Like, just as Kala said, that is what climate justice looked like to me. It's a world where I can sing and dance with my friends and just be in the sunlight and not be afraid. I want to bring that out from you guys. I want to hear the joys that you're already seeing in the climate movement and how you think that is what the climate justice world that we're building looks like. Who wants to start? <laughs> okay, she you go. Yeah, um, hello. I love that question so much and it actually moved me how you asked it because it made me excited to Im think about that world when we're t here talking about how fossil fuels are ruining that for us. And one time at the closing of a panel, they asked me the same question, what does justice look like to you? And I said, justice looks like joy, because it's joy for our communities, joy for our children. Joy happens when there's no violence, and the climate crisis is violence. The climate crisis is companies taking things away from you. The climate crisis is disasters ruining your homes. The climate crisis is leaving your home because you can't farm anymore. The climate crisis is climate migration. And we don't want that. We want joy. We want to be able to experience and feel and dance and have community. And that is what the world looks like to me. And it also looks like truth because what we are ha have been fighting for is campaigns of companies telling us recycle, of companies telling us that's what's going to solve the plastic crisis. And only 9% of plastic gets recycled. All the plastic out of 100 bottles that you put in the recycling bin, 9% only gets recycled. It's all lies, and we want truth. People ask me, like Mitzi just said, what is the one thing I can do? The one thing you can do is become an activist yourself. Because we don't have all the solutions. The solutions are going to come from your own brain, your own imagination, your own surroundings. I cannot tell you what you can do culturally in your hometown. That's going to have to come from your brain and your work and your thought process. But what I can tell you is that the principles that have to guide your imagination are principles of collaboration, principles of joy, and principles of protecting past and future knowledge. Hired, would you like to go next? Um, actually, I'm not a justice specialist, but one thing that I can say is uh, uh, justice never actually exists, existed on this earth. Um, earlier, you know, uh, different countries, superpowers, they have colonized all the low middle income countries. And at, around, uh, at that time, our countries were like colony for one country. And now our countries are colonies for many countries. Amazing. They're coming to us. They're providing us international development fund. They're giving us loan. And they are actually deciding 
on behalf of us what we should do and what we not, should not. They are foisting, you know, fossil fuel in the name of international support. And they are putting us in the vicious cycle of the fossil fuel. They are divesting from the fossil fuel in their countries, but they're investing on fossil fuel in our countries. So if we can stop that, then it will be justice. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, for me, when Michi was asking this question, Kalo was saying that we have our priorities, we want to do parties. <laughs> and <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now everybody knows the joke. <laughs> okay, so yeah, this is our <laughs> priority. But uh, other than this, uh, we weren't, actually, uh, in my mind, uh, our world looks like where politicians know and do their job. <laughs> I know and do my job and everyone know and do their job because this is so easy. Why we need to step on someone else's job and say you, this is your job and do you know that this is your job and why are you, if you know why aren't you doing it and uh, this message is especially for fossil fuel and governments and uh, we don't like no, don't need to go to other countries for conferences and like talk and talk and talk and hope that yes someone listen to us but we wanna yes also go in other countries to see awesome things and you can also come to our countries to see that how beautiful our country is and if uh, this floods is not destroying how more beautiful it can be and how actually we are destroying some countries only for like our own development which I don't even think development because the government as uh, they said the government is lying and they are saying that yes this is your development but if the fossil fuel plants which we are building today will not exist in 50 years and yes this is like scientific that a plant can't be like work properly after 50 years so the thing which not work for 50 years why we need to go from coal to gas when we know the solution is not even for like solution even I cannot I wish I live long <laughs> so I, after my life I cannot even see a gas power plant functioning so this is no solution and if this is not solution why we are selling it as a solution and so I think um, in my view of world that the solution which is actually true is the solution we all are like proposing everywhere and yeah also we can like travel and see lands which is beautiful great question um and just really clarifying obviously young people have other stuff that they do um <laughs> just really clarifying that point and it was a joke um what i think we need for our future uh we need more young people at decision-making tables because mm -hmm. if our elders cannot make the decision, then, you know, retire and we can step <laughs> up. Um, because unfortunately... <laughs> and the reason why I think that this is really important is because, you know, <laughs> young people from the Marshall Islands, for example, were a real key push to ensure that 1.5 actually became a massive part of Paris Agreement. And that's forgotten usually. Um, Pacific people are drivers and young people are drivers of change. They're innovators and they're hopeful and they don't tire perhaps as easily. And so I think that's the key. We need young people at decision-making tables um, because like someone said, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And I mm. would rather not be eaten um, on the menu, so I'd prefer not to be. So yes, I think that's what we need more of. We need energetic young people who are excited and can believe that there is change coming.
I am so amazed at what young people of every generation has done, actually. If you look at historical moments in society, young people have been there alongside the most marginalized sectors of society, leading the way towards change. And this is the latest wave of change that it has to happen because this is quite a crucial one, I would like to say. Um, we have two, two time for two questions. Um, okay, yes, go ahead. Uh, do we have one last yep. or no? That's it. So let's be mindful of the time so that people can actually one of the people ask in the, the question. Movement. I actually remember the 70s Stockholm conference. Uh, and I also remember a time before that, and I think there is probably a role for people like me, senior citizens and uh, young people to work together. Because I actually remember a world where we didn't have any plastic hardly at all. We never had cell phones. Uh, uh, none of the people that I knew, and I lived in the developed world, had a car. And we took our bicycles around. Everybody who had a house had a garden in the back and raised a lot of their own vegetables. And there was still a lot of uh, a lot of wild space in nature, and we didn't have a climate crisis, although we had the seeds of it. We were also at a time of decolonization, a process that was starting in my youth and when I was going to college and so on. So it's a world that has existed. There was a sustainable world of sorts. It wasn't a world without problems. Even the world we have in the future that we imagine will have problems mm -hmm. because now we think that we're going to just keep the economy going with uh, some kind of sustainable uh, solar panels and uh, windmills and so on, and uh, we can't do that really. We can't really keep extracting nature and using resources even if, even if uh, we're trying to minimize it. Uh, so there was a world like that, and I remember that, and it was a happy world uh, where people uh, cared for each other and it was a good place to be in. It was rather modest. Uh, we didn't play a lot of computer games, we didn't play any, <laughs> uh, and, and so on. So that type of world, I, I've become very no nostalgic for that world lately. And I think we seniors and uh, young people who are trying to imagine a new world have some space where we could dialogue on these things. Thank you. I would love to see that world. We were colonized for 300 years and then again, and then we were free. But um, does anyone yeah. want to say anything more to that? Yeah, I think, you know, intergenerational is how our societies were created in the Pacific. We didn't do anything without our elders. What I would like is for our elders to be able to rest, and I would like for our young people to rest. And I think acknowledging also what you said, Mitzi, perhaps it was a happier world in this part of the world, but in Global South, for example, in the Pacific, we were being colonized. We were dealing with diseases we'd never had. Our, my beautiful Aotearoa New Zealand had its land taken from indigenous people. So perhaps it's really thinking about what was, but actually looking forward at what could be instead, for acknowledging also that, yes, we had some good times, but not everyone was having those good times, unfortunately. Do we have other questions? Yes, go ahead. No, thank you so much. I just, I just want to thank all of you so much because I've been a youth act activist as well. Like, I was very active on these kind of panels like 10 years ago. Oh, <laughs> and, <no>. uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and long before that, when I was a very small child, I grew up in Sweden, and I was out in nature, like growing up close to nature, talking to the trees, talking to stones. I knew that everything in nature was alive. But when I went to school and told other people about that, I, I was bullied, because this is not the way people see the world in my part of the world. Um, but now, I really try to to get that back to because I, I know that that's the truth and I, the indigenous peoples in the world have kept that at the core. You know that. That's part of your worldview. And I think that what we really need to do in our part of the world, we need to get that worldview back and we can find it again. I, I, I really wished that I was an indigenous person when I grew up and I was so sad that I was not. But I am the one I am and if we look back, at our ancestors as far as we can get. Like, we are all related and we have that wisdom. The original wisdom is there in all of us and we can awaken that again. So let us all become good ancestors for the future. Thank you. Does anyone wanna answer the question? Thank you for that comment. I hope that 
you know, when we're your age, we're not watching another panel of youth climate activists talking about the same thing. Hopefully, we're talking about a different topic by then. Um, <laughs> but it is also the end of our panel. I would like to thank everyone in this room. And I would like to invite everyone to continue imagining what that climate just world looks like and pushing that to people, showing that to people, showing that we're not just anti something and we're not just anti fossil fuels or pro peace and pro justice and pro love and pro joy and pro parties. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> but yes, thank you so much. And there is a lot of panels coming after us, I think. And I hope you guys enjoy. Um, just two more, two more. Yes.